any uh, aspiring boy racers out there, a few things you have to do to a car if you want to make a car look cool in a modern mentality, right? It has to have a loud exhaust, right? People have to hear you coming before they see you. And the second thing, it's an absolute must for any, any aspiring boy racer, you can take notes if you want, um, is that you have to have big alloys, right? So, like, most cars come standard, maybe 15-inch alloys, but 16-inch alloys, then 17, now we're starting to get cool, 18, and then if you're an American gangsta, because they don't say gangster, gangsta, they have 21-inch alloys, which are just these massive, massive big rims, okay? Now, what's interesting is, like, if you just take kind of a step back from that, you think, wow, this is, this is a status symbol. And then, or maybe you've got a farmer, like, you know, who fights to get, an, like, an extra acre of land or an extra acre on this side or whatever it is and increases his, 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 his land holding. Or you've got, like, a, a business person who, who goes through all these efforts and time and stress and divorces in order to get, you know, increases business and so on and so forth. And then you think maybe countries trying to take over other countries, right, and, like, annihilating different countries have taken over their lands. And you go like one step bigger again. Like, what if you owned half the planet? <laughs> if you watched, if you ever watched any of these programs on, on the universe, on space, okay, even if you owned the whole Earth, it's such a tiny little speck. And I, I found this, this diagram once of uh, our, our solar system. We think our solar system, it takes an awful long time. I'm not sure if you travel at the speed of light. I don't know actually how long it would take to get from one side to the other, but quite a bit, quite a bit, but the, the, the universe is 14 billion years old, more or less, so sci scientists say, so that's, that's uh, f 14 billion years traveling at the speed of light, it, like, what, it's, the, the, this, the, the, the figures, of the, the, the statistics are just absolutely mind-boggling, you look at the size of our sun, which is ginormous and heats us from all that distance away, and yet it's nowhere near the biggest sun in the universe that we know of. We know of others that are, that, that completely dwarf it. Now back to where we started. I've got bigger alloys than you. <laughs> you know, and the grand scheme of things, the things that we consider important are so <laughs> ridiculous. In the, on the grand scheme of things, when you think of eternity and heaven and all that we're called to up there, who cares? What's a, uh, hang on, I can't remember the name. Louis Fenton, what's the name of that snobby handbag thing? Fenton, Vent, Venton, Venton, what's it called? Fenton. Sorry, I've got my Louis, Louis, isn't it? Louis Fenton, something like that. Okay, right. I've got myself a Louis. Who, who, who cares? <laughs> so on the grand scheme of things, do these things matter at all? You know, like, again, like when you step back and back and back and back further, even if, you know, like the, the Pharaohs will be reading more about Pharaoh. Uh, in the coming days now in the book of Exodus. Like, they, they considered themselves gods. They owned so much of the, of the known world at the time or controlled it. And at the end of the day, they're now buried in the tomb. They rotted away just like everyone else. Well, slightly embalmed, so maybe they preserved it a little longer than most people, but oh, they're dead and they're gone. That's it. And there might, might, there might be a nice statue in their honor somewhere. So what? So what? It's very interesting when, when you drive through cities as well. And cities might, the, the names might have the names of, of certain streets might be from certain people. So even though there's a whole street named after them, I still have no idea who they were. Like Grafton Street in Dublin. Miss Grafton, Mr. Grafton, I have no idea. I should probably know, I don't know, okay, no one knows, that's good. You see, that's point proven. Like it's, it's a very famous street and no one knows who it's named after. You know, like it, it, so even if you were to be so important and so powerful that a street name, or even a town named after you, at the end of the day, like people will forget you even then. That's very negative. Okay. Point being, in heaven, in heaven, that's where, that, that's where everything starts to make sense. That's where, like, the, all of these things that we consider important here just aren't anymore. And that's where, like, when the chips are down, the only thing that counts, the only thing that lasts is, is the love with which we have lived. Because the more, more I love, the more my life is transformed into something, like, divine. The more my life becomes Christ-like. And it, it, it's love that transforms me, my family, the world around me, my parish, whatever it is. It's love. It's, o it's only love that counts. Everything else is useless, unless it serves love. So that way, any work I do can serve God, but any work without God is useless. 
anything I do with God, if it's street cleaning, if it's power hose and a path, as we'll be doing later, painting the chapel, hopefully I'll be doing in the afternoon, any of these things on their own are kind of pointless. With God, they have an eternal value because I'm doing them out of love for God. I was just reading a, a story recently when I think of, of, of people like who really lived this and really understood it. Then they have this, what would you call it? It's like a healthy, a healthy understanding of the world and a healthy understanding of the futility of so many things. So martyrs, for example, they were able to look at the world and say, oh, the world is a good, it's a good thing. It's, it's, it's created by God. It's beautiful. It's fallen, but it's, it is beautiful. But that's not what I'm here for. I, don't, I haven't been created just for this, just for the world, just to build things up or design things. That's not what I'm here for. I'm here for, for something much, much better. And there's this book which was given to me, Ireland's Loyalty to the Mass, and there are some fairly astounding stories. Like our, our, when we think of Irish saints, we generally go the whole way back to St. Patrick and, and St. Bridget. But anybody in the last 600 years has, has kind of forgotten. And there are, there are, there are many. I'm about to read you uh, the story of one. So there's this uh, local, local enough to hear, right, local enough to, to Clonmel, uh, uh, a wealthy man named Victor White. Victor White was a Catholic. <clears throat> this is in the six, mid, late 16th century, uh, 1585. So uh, Queen Elizabeth is in power and things aren't going so, so well for Catholics here in Ireland. So Victor White uh, hears of this, by all accounts, saintly priest, Morris Kenrichten, who's uh, in the jail in Clonmel. So through a little bit of bribery and <clears throat> a generous... Uh, envelope under the table, if they had envelopes, if they had tables. Um, he bribes the, the governor to let the priest out for Easter. All right? So the priest is let out. He comes to Victor's house, Victor White. He comes to Victor White's house to celebrate Mass for Easter, celebrate the Easter vigil. Now, unexpectedly, Sir John Norris, the uh, president of Munster, this, this area of Ireland, uh, comes to visit the town, comes to visit Clonmel. And the governor of the jail is scared to death that if, if it's all, if it's discovered what happened, he will suffer the consequences of it. So he says, ha ha, now I've just uh, devised this cunning plan to catch all of these Catholics. So I've released the priest so that all the Catholics will gather together for this mass and then you can catch them all together, celebrating mass. So that's what, Sir John Norris then does, um, during the Easter ceremonies, uh, he goes to Victor, Victor White's house with a band of soldiers, surrounds the house and then rushes it, uh, during which then women, children, men jumping out windows, jumping out doors and all scattering in all sorts of directions in, in the middle of the night to try and get away from the uh, soldiers. Uh, they couldn't find the priest anywhere, though. Couldn't find Father Morris anywhere. Father Morris had managed to jump out a window and was hiding in a, in a haystack. But to be sure, to be sure, some of the soldiers, when they saw the haystack, to make sure there wasn't anyone there, they piked it. And on a few occasions, they hit him, but he didn't groan or moan or anything. Just lay there quietly until they left. But the soldiers weren't happy enough to do that, just to, 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 to leave a such empty-handed with no priest. So they took Victor White custody and threatened him with death and uh, condemned him to death then eventually by hanging, drawing and quartering for treason against the Queen. And I thought that, I was just reading the story, I thought this is absolutely, this is, this is amazing. And then I read the next bit. Hearing of his friend's danger and knowing well the punishment that awaited him, Father Morris at once left his refuge in the country, made his way back to Clonmel, where, surrendering himself to the hands of the authorities, he was loaded with chains and flung into a noisy dungeon. During his trials, threats and promises were prodigally used, but he would neither renounce the faith nor acknowledge the queen. Firm as a mighty rock, Lashed by a raging surf, <clears throat> no threat, however violent, 
No punishment, however awful, could draw him, could draw from him even one word that might lead to the discovery of those that had assisted at the masses or received from him the sacraments. Condemned to die, he was dragged on a hurdle <coughs> at the horse's tail to the scaffold, beneath whose shadow he spoke to the people and exhorted them to be true to the faith to the end. While still half alive, he was taken down, so he was, he was hanged, and then while still half alive, he was taken down. Partly by entreaties and partly by bribes, <coughs> the quartering of his body was prevented. Um, it doesn't say how, but I presume he was decapitated. But while the rest of his remains were buried at the Franciscan church in the town, that's here in Clamel, his head was cut off, oh, there we go, his head was cut off and put on a stake above the market cross on the 30th of April, 1585. <clears throat> when you hear something like that, yeah, it's just amazing how it puts what we do, what I do with my day, into perspective. You know, if, if this is what a priest was willing to do, and, and like from his perspective, he could say, well, maybe it's, maybe it's better that I escape because I can celebrate more masses elsewhere. <clears throat> I can hear confessions elsewhere. And it's thought that he was morally obliged, even by, by, by God, to surrender. He didn't have to surrender. He chose to, to protect the life of his friend, knowing that if you do, you will die because you're a priest. And he does so. It's just, just astounding. Absolutely incredible. I'm hoping actually to pop in. I've seen that there's a plaque on the wall there uh, in Clamel. Um, but after reading the story, I want to, I, have, I don't actually know where his grave is, but I want to find out uh, and go and, and, and visit him. And he most definitely is in heaven and ask him to pray for me that I can be genie, a tenth of the priest he was. It's just, when you read something like this, it reminds us, it should remind us. Today you have 13 hours of daylight left. 13 hours. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do with today? We have, we have to take a couple of meals out of that. Maybe a bit of travel here and there. But even, even traveling, even eating meals, even preparing meals, you have 13 hours. How much love can you squeeze into today? The, the, even, if you're, even if you're on holidays and you know, you're going to the beach, even that, great. In all of that, life, just be glorifying God as his, as his sun is shining down on you and you say, Lord, you are amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much for holidays. Thank you so much for the sun. Thank you so much for this beautiful part of the world. Thank you that we can travel freely. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord, for, for ice cream on a hot day. Like even, even that like, can be a prayer. Like, Lord, I really do. I really, really thank you for this. Just the simple, see, like sanctity and, and all of these things, they're, they're not super complicated and they're not out there. It's what I choose to do with my day now. So we have, we've started our day with prayer. We started our day with the Eucharist. And now from, from, from now on, it's not like prayer has ended or, or like kind of mass will have ended. But my, my unity with the Lord, that must continue in everything. In everything. And one day, we will leave all of this. And then that's, that's that period, that's, that's that chance finished. <laughs> you know, like, like at 10 o'clock tonight, today is over. You know, I'll hopefully be heading to sleep uh, at around that point. And then today, today is gone, right? I, I won't have today again. So what do I do with it? What do I do with it while I have it? We think of St. Bonaventure, we think of Moses, we think of Father Morris, these people who, who just understood that this life is passing. They understood the greatness of the things to come and set their hearts on them, set their hearts on, on the higher things, on the things that come from our maker in heaven. And that's, that's all that mattered to them. So when we listen to these stories, let us not just be entertained by them but may we, may we be inspired to imitate them to imitate the lives of the saints and to become in all humility saints ourselves Amen